Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Arg Verma from IIT Kanpur and we have been talking about knowledge in this uh, course on advanced uh, cognitive processes. Now, I will try and uh, make you remember what else we have been talking about. So, we started talking about knowledge uh, uh, when we started talking about what a concept is, we started talking about what are the various ways people use concepts, what, what basically uh, does a concept afford us, how does it afford us to categorize and classify the information in the visual world uh, or information in the world or in around us or the environment around us into various uh, understandable uh, boxes. So, you know that you know something is an animal, something is a mammal for that matter, something is a you know some object is a chair and a chair is needed to is a, you know affords sitting uh, or a table affords uh, keeping your stuff on those kind of things we were starting we basically began with something like that then we talked about uh, different approaches to this categorization so we talked about uh, whether you are uh, using a prototype approach or whether you are using an exemplar approach to making these categorizations we also talked about uh, one of the uh, very uh, famous networks we talked about uh, the semantic network theory uh, which was the first pro uh, proposed by uh, Collins and Quillen we talked about that uh, uh, because it was the first network theory what did it mean what is actually a semantic network so uh, things like say for example in a semantic network there could be uh, uh, objects or uh, things like animals or fruits or uh, plants at particular nodes and those are connected to other nodes via these uh, links which are property links is has uh, or can those kind of links in the next lecture we talked about uh, parallel distributed processing we talked about uh, the newer uh, architectures and how parallel distributed processing basically works uh, also in the recent lecture if you re remember i was talking about one, uh, some of the broader uses of knowledge some of the broader uses of knowledge uh, require basically uh, involve us having larger schemas, uh, it, they involve us having a script that we kind of you know almost automatedly run, say for example a script to go to a restaurant or a script to go to a, a school or how do you uh, you know visit a dentist, those kind of things. So if you see uh, we have in some sense uh, you know we have been talking about what basically it is to have knowledge, uh, we have pondered a little bit about the structure of what knowledge is. And we've also talked a little bit about, say, for example, how people have been using knowledge in different ways. You know, starting even from the first lecture when we were talking about, you know, what is it that a concept afford affords us? You know, what do you know about the world which is embedded in a concept? And you know, we we talked about things like, say, for example, if I am saying an apple, uh, an apple as a concept can tell us quite a few things. You know, an apple as a concept tells us that it is a fruit, that it is sweet, that it is red in color. It also tells us that, say, for example is found in Shimla, California. Uh, it might tell us that you know uh, somebody likes uh, eating uh, an apple or it could remind us of things like you know an apple a day keeps a doctor away and those kind of things. Uh, from there we have uh, you know uh, moved on to a slightly broader uh, ways uh, uh, things like uh, if you talk about the last lecture we were talking about what are broader knowledge. We, we do not really see the world only in concepts you know we uh, see say for example see the world uh, in ways in how we are using our knowledge to interact with the world. See, for example, that was basically the point of, uh, you know, the schemas and uh, the scripts that we were talking about. Today's lecture is uh, going to be based upon uh, something which is, which has to do uh, with making the connection between the, uh, you know, the metaphysical that is uh, cognition uh, with the slightly physical aspect of it that is the brain. So, I am going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, how knowledge is represented in the human brain. You know, what does the brain do? How does the brain understand that this is an apple and this is an orange? Or say for example, how does the brain represent, uh, let us say your cat, you know, uh, does the brain represent the cat as a whole? Is there a place marker cell in the brain which uh, has the picture of a cat and every time you see the, you know, uh, cat, it, this one just lights up. Uh, these cells are called neurons if you remember in the last lecture we have talked in some detail about these things. Uh, but coming back, so is the, is the brain doing that? Is the brain storing uh, aspects of knowledge at particular sites in the brain and then these, uh, these particular sites are responsible for us having that knowledge. 
Now, uh, today's lecture, uh, again, I'm not going to go into heavy neuroscience stuff and I'm not really going to talk about uh, too many of those details. But the point I will try and put forth is the fact that uh, if you make either of the two assumptions and the second assumption is, say for example, the brain uh, stores the cat as a set of distributed features. Okay, So, it could either be that there is a place marker uh, neuron in the brain that stores a picture of a cat uh, and it, you know, every time you see a cat, that picture lights up. We can complicate this story a little bit. Say, suppose I say, uh, is this particular neuron uh, storing the picture of uh, my cat uh, or is it storing the picture of, you know, somebody else's cat or a wild cat or a, you know, brown colored cat or a black cat. You know, you can ask and you can complicate this story a little bit, but I'm not really going there. Uh, I'm trying to uh, draw your attention to what might be the problems of such an approach. However, there's an other uh, alternative approach that has uh, been around ever since this one has been, is that the brain is basically storing these things uh, in a more distributed fashion. So, the brain is not really, let us say, storing cat per se, but the brain uh, might be in different areas storing facts that this is an animal. Uh, you know, maybe the name is cat uh, and then physical features, say for example, the cat uh, catches mice uh, or the cat eats fish or say for example, things like the cat has fur, the cat has four limbs, it has whiskers, uh, you know, it has, uh, you know, it pounces on things. So, different areas of the brain basically represent these different things. So, it could be a pattern of activity uh, across, uh, you know, these different uh, neurons and these different things light up in a particular pattern whenever you come across a cat. Incidentally, there is an experiment about a cat uh, which we will be talking about in today's class. So, this is probably going to be the crux of what I have to say in today's lecture. Today's lecture uh, is the fifth lecture on knowledge and uh, the uh, basic point of this lecture is representation of knowledge in the brain. So, uh, again, let me, let me come back to uh, the original question that I am going to ask in this. The original question in this, in today's lecture that we will be talking about is how are these different categories and different concepts that we have been talking about till now represented in the human brain? And there are different kinds of evidence that have been coming up. So, uh, if you did not believe that, you know, there could be a particular cell uh, or a particular neuron that could be representing a cat, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So, in the brain, in the human brain, there is an area called the fusiform face area uh, is basically uh, one that responds very strongly to faces. So, this is an area that, uh, that lights up almost always whenever you are seeing a face. Suppose, uh, in an experimental task, you are made to see faces and some other object, let us say, you know, houses or uh, let us say letters or anything else. Uh, whenever uh, you are processing the face, let us say telling me that whether it is a face or an orange or whether it is a face or a house, uh, this is the area that will help you make that decision. Okay. So, this is the, this area is called the fusiform face area and then there is another area in the brain uh, which is referred to as the parahippocampal place area. Obviously, it is in the, it's in the parahippocampal uh, region uh, and this is the area that selectively responds to houses. So, we have one area in the brain that is uh, responding to uh, faces, we have one area which is selectively responding to houses. Can we say at this point that this is the area in the brain where all your knowledge about a face is stored? Or can you say that this is the area, you know, in which all your knowledge about the house is, about houses in general is stored? Now, Again, to take this case a little bit forward, people have also shown that when, uh, you know, when uh, people suffer injury uh, into either of these two areas, uh, that there is a sort of deficit that surfaces and that deficit is called uh, prosopagnosia. If you are talking about fusiform face area, if somebody has suffered somehow uh, some damage due to, uh, you know, brain hemorrhage or some accident to the uh, fusiform face area, uh, there is a uh, defect that comes up which is called the prosop which is called prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is basically inability to recognize faces. So, people who suffer damage to uh, fusiform face area suffer uh, which is in the temporal lobe. Uh, cannot successfully recognize faces. So, again, it is a, you know, evidence in favor. But can you really uh, run with this? Uh, is it possible that uh, the person is not recognizing any face or how is it uh, really happening? Uh, we have seen, uh, again, if you remember uh, the earlier classes, 
you've talked about the fact that people uh, may not be able to just recognize by face, but they are able to recognize by voice. You know, prosopagnosic patients can recognize the people they are around with by their voice, for example. Now, is just the visual configuration of face damaged or all the other knowledge related to that face is damaged? If say for example, damage to uh, the fusiform face area would have taken all your knowledge about the face, then we are probably talking about specific regions and specific concepts. But we see even in patients uh, of prosopagnosia that the visual configuration processing is damaged, but the idea is that they can process, uh, they can recognize the individuals uh, by listening to their voice and everything else about them kind of comes back. So, uh, you know, the person would recall that, okay, this is my brother or this is my sister and I have played uh, with the, him for the, you know, earlier part of my life and we used to do these things. So, again, everything else is intact, only the visual processing is probably damaged. Now, this is one of the reasons why uh, theories which have uh, very strongly suggested in the past that specific areas of the brain might be representing specific concepts have not really worked so well. The generally accepted notion is the fact that the brain representations or the brain basically represents uh, uh, stimuli in a more, much more distributed sense. Okay. So, uh, different kinds of stimuli uh, cause activity across a variety of brain areas because there is obviously, I mean, uh, it could be logical also if you look at it like this, there are different uh, aspects of knowledge about that, uh, uh, you know, different aspects of knowledge about a particular concept and uh, obviously in that sense it is stored in different areas. The motion is stored in different area, the uh, different kind of, uh, you know, visual processing things are stored in different area, auditory information if there is such is stored in a different area, that's, that's all possible. That's basically what the more accepted notion of uh, this uh, is here. So, why is this happening? What is it, uh, you know, why is this uh, distributed processing happening? So, if you try to answer the, uh, the why of this, uh, it is basically what I was saying. So, objects basically consist of many properties, things like texture, uh, form, color, motion, etc. Also, there are other kind of properties, suppose behavioral properties, you know, like cats catch mice, uh, they sleep during the day, they fight with other cats. Uh, they might also have uh, different other uh, properties like, you know, emotional properties. Uh, say, for example, you are very attached with your pet cat, you know, those kind of things. So, the representation of objects, things like say for example, a cat would then necessarily uh, activate many different areas of your brain. They would activate the sensory processing areas, they would activate the motor uh, processing or motor planning areas, they would also activate higher level areas where your uh, emotions about the cat or the memories about the particular cat are also, uh, you know, uh, coded like that. Also, your limbic system, emotional areas, maybe if there is some fear that you have attached to cats, maybe the amygdala is going to get lightened up. Okay, so I'm not really talking a lot of, uh, you know, theory uh, or uh, stuff here. I'm just trying to give you a, a basic hang of what uh, I'm talking about when I'm saying that uh, it is more accepted uh, that uh, the brain represents uh, stimuli in a much more distributed sense. Let us take this a uh, little bit further. So, uh, people have tried to look at single neurons. People have tried to look at uh, what aspect of a particular stimuli is encoded or is possibly stored by a single neuron. So, uh, Friedman basically did this uh, very interesting uh, study and he wanted to look at single neurons and what are the, what are the aspect of particular stimuli that single neurons are uh, storing. So, he basically uh, started taking recordings from uh, single neurons of a monkey's brain and the idea was that they wanted to check uh, how does a monkey uh, represent uh, you know particular concepts say for example a cat or a dog so they uh, he actually asked monkeys basically trained these monkeys to differentiate between two stimuli uh, one was a cat and one was a dog so you can see here in this figure uh, to my extreme left is a 100% cat and to my extreme right is a 100% dog and in the middle there are uh, mixtures of features from both uh, the cat and the dog and the idea is that the monkey has to be able to decide the crossover point is when something is a 60% a cat or something is 60% a dog and the monkey has been trained over and over again uh, you know with repeated trials with multiple training uh, procedures that the monkey should be able to distinguish between when something is a cat or when something is a dog. 
So this is the basic task that uh, they asked uh, the monkey to do. So they trained whenever a particular stimulus was more than 50% cat, the monkey should be able to tell it as a cat, do something, press, uh, give a response. When it is more than 50% a dog, then uh, you know press something else and say it, that it is a dog. This is the uh, training that was given. Uh, then they actually conducted an experiment. They, the test procedure was something like this. So uh, first a sample was shown. You can see here on the left, a sample is shown. The sample is uh, a cat and then there's a one second delay and then the test uh, sample is shown. And the monkey has to look at the test sample and basically answer the question say, is the test stimulus uh, from the same category as the earlier sample stimulus. So monkey uh, is really, uh, you just have to compare the test uh, stimulus with the sample stimulus and decide whether both of them are same or not. Some visual analysis uh, is uh, basically required here and also some memory of the fact that uh, you know you saw the sample. So I will just describe this uh, procedure in a little bit more detail. So first a sample stimulus, either a cat or a dog was presented, then after one second delay a test stimulus was presented. The monkey's task was to release a lever if it judged that the test stimulus was same as the sample stimulus or uh, do something else. Uh, as the monkeys were doing this, now this is the main part, Friedman basically was recording neurons uh, in an area of the temporal uh, lobe called the inferotemporal cortex. So one neuron from the inferotemporal cortex and a neuron from the prefrontal cortex. So two kinds of neurons were basically chosen and two uh, neurons were recorded. Now, if you look at the results, I will go to the results uh, in the graphic form very soon. The results basically showed that the neuron from the inferotemporal cortex, the IT, shows that the presentation of the sample when the monkey is just looking at the stimuli, this neuron fired more to the dog stimulus. So uh, the neuron basically is doing the visual analysis properly in this case. I am talking about the trial that I just presented. During the delay and test periods, when the monkey is holding information about the stimuli in memory and then making a category judgment, this neuron responds in the same way to the cat and dog stimuli. So some kind of processing is happening here. You can see, uh, if you can see the sample on the uh, left is from the inferotemporal cortex and the sample from the uh, right is from the prefrontal cortex. You will see uh, when the sample is there, uh, basically the neuron is firing more for the uh, dog which is uh, the red one. And uh, during the delay uh, and the test, there is uh, typically no difference. Uh, in the prefrontal cortex, uh, you will see that the neuron is firing differently uh, to the dog and to the cat uh, stimuli, uh, even though the firing for the dog is much more. In, and basically, if you see the figure uh, here, as the time passes, uh, the, there is uh, much more divergence between the cat firing and the dog firing. So some kind of differentiation to the responses is also there. So the results from the prefrontal cortex basically suggest that this neuron responds slightly better to the dog stimuli as you saw, uh, although the difference is small and it is not really significant in any sense. During the delay, however, the neuron fires more rapidly to the dog, uh, seems like this corresponds to holding properties of the dog in the memory. Uh, monkey is uh, basically trying to uh, recollect the properties of uh, what the dog is, so the delay is there. During the test, when the monkey is making a decision, the differences uh, in responses, you can see, they actually become uh, much larger. So the divergence is much more clearer and you see that there is some kind of decision is made. So this is the uh, thing. So Friedman's results tell us that the different areas of the cortex uh, might be responding to different aspects of the stimuli. The inferotemporal cortex, which distinguishes between the dogs and cats during the presentation of the stimuli, appears to be responding to the features and the shapes of the dog and cat stimuli. So you can uh, see here that when the sample is presented, then there is a differentiated response from the inferotemporal cortex, basically telling us that some kind of sophisticated visual analysis is being carried out here. The prefrontal cortex which distinguishes between cats and dogs you, because you saw in the test phase the activity diverged uh, pretty much is basically making a decision and this decision is basically it is also probably based on the more abstract properties of the stimuli that are characteristic of dogs and cats in general. Uh, so this is again, uh, it does not really tell us a lot, but this experiment tells us that it might be possible that even though there is not a single place where a particular concept is housed, but uh, the way these different areas of the brain respond to particular stimuli might be different. So 
again it tells us that uh, there is some uh, water uh, in the argument the fact that uh, the brain is representing knowledge in a much more distributed sense now that was that uh, people have also start you know looked at the uh, neuropsychological side of things they have there has been a lot of research about representation of knowledge in the brain uh, via neuropsychological studies what are neuropsychological studies neuropsychological studies are studies of the behavior of people with some kind of brain damage now this brain damage can be developmental uh, congenitally or uh, due to some uh, reason developmental lags or it could be acquired via some accident or something now neuropsychological research on how categories are represented in the brain are has been focused on the patients with category specific knowledge imp impairment say for example we were talking about prosopagnosia earlier so uh, people like this who have category specific knowledge impairment in which the people uh, in which the people might have trouble in re recognizing objects in one uh, of the you know one category so you can see, uh, uh, you know, these are basically results from two patients, uh, KC and EW, who have difficulty naming animals, but have been found, uh, you know, perfectly fine with naming uh, non-living things like, you know, fruits and vegetables. So you see, patient KC responds, uh, you know, uh, the correct performance is over 80% for non-living things, but uh, under 50% uh, for living things. Similarly, similar pattern is there in patient EW as well. And both of these uh, uh, are basically derived from a study from uh, Blando and colleagues or Mahon and Karamaza. And this is uh, the figure is sourced from Goldstein's book on cognitive psychology. Now, people from uh, moving from uh, neuropsychology, people have also looked at brain scanning and people have actually tried to look at when participants are making these differences and somebody is uh, scanning their brain. So it's not really possible to conduct single cell uh, recordings in uh, human beings because of ethical concerns, really want to make an incision in somebody's brain and check. Uh, but one of the easier techniques available to us is things like neuroimaging. You know, you can actually put somebody in an fMRI scanner, obviously ask them to do so, uh, request them uh, and then uh, check whether that when they are responding to particular kinds of stimuli, what is it that is happening in their brain. So in a range of neuroimaging studies, differences in the brain's responses to living and non-living things have also been demonstrated. So if you see here in the last diagram, there was a difference between how people respond to living and non-living things. And in this study here, you can already see that there are different areas of the brain that respond to living and non-living organisms. So you can see that blue-green areas are uh, were activated by naming pictures of tools, which is the inner uh, region, and the red-yellow uh, areas are basically activated when people were naming animals. Again, this figure is also sourced so from Goldstein's book on cognitive psychology, but again, it kind of makes the point that there are neuroimaging is one of the methods that you can see how people are responding to these different uh, stimuli. Now, the difference in the areas of the brain that are activated in response to animals and to tools has been observed also when words were presented instead of pictures. So, in the earlier you can actually see pictures, but even if you present words, say for example, if I am presenting, you know, hammer, axe, uh, scissor, etc., or I am presenting, uh, you know, cat, dog, uh, buffalo, etc., uh, even in words, when you are not really seeing the picture, there is no visual analysis of the features happening here. But still, uh, the difference in activation uh, has been observed. So words such as crow, pigeon, horse uh, might have activated one set of one areas, one set of areas in the brain, and words such as flute, fork, and crayon might have activated other set. Of. Again, this is from a study from Wheatley and colleagues. However, the, along with these uh, category-specific uh, activations that are observed, it has also been shown that areas activated by animals respond to the kinds of motions associated with animals. You know, particular kind of uh, motion that a particular animal does, such as walking or running. Also, areas activated by tools also respond to the kind of motions associated with tools. So, there are different areas which are probably coding these motion-related properties of these concepts which are animals and non-living uh, things or man-made objects. These findings, if you look at them and you just take a step back and try and wonder what this, uh, what these things are telling us, they tell us that it kind of confirms, uh, again, uh, reconfirms the notion of distributed nature of categories in the brain. So different areas of the brain are coding for different properties and that is why different areas of the brain are lighting up when different kind of properties are being tested for. Now, our knowledge of these categories seems also be distributed in many areas of the brain, including areas that respond to the other properties associated with the objects, such as motion, uh, physical form, and you know, emotional or other uh, kind of characteristics. So, I hope uh, we're still uh, making uh, the point uh, clear that uh, you know what these differences are and where are they stemming from. Some more research 
points out in the same direction, say for example, Simmons and colleagues, they ob showed observers pictures of food such as cookies and hamburgers and these pictures were, uh, you know, found to be activating areas both in the visual cortex uh, which are uh, associated with the food's appearance and shape and also other areas which are basically more associated to the food's taste. So, even say for example, if you are looking at particular food, one area in the brain might be going up and saying, okay, this looks good, this looks delicious or it does not look delicious and the other area of the brain is basically talking about, uh, you know, is it delicious or not. So, again in my description I kind of mixed the visual and the delicious part, but this is how we think. But the brain might be doing it differently. Brain might be just doing the visual analysis and doing this taste analysis in a different region. But we generally do not talk like that and in that sense we think like you know delicious foods are probably stored somewhere else. Let us take another study. Another. Uh, 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 Kilgore and colleagues basically showed pictures of uh, foods, uh, they also showed that pictures of food also activate amygdala that is an area which is uh, associated with experiencing emotions. You know, so food can have emotional uh, connections to people. Uh, we keep hearing about uh, the fact that you know depressed people eat more or obesity is linked to depression or say for example you might uh, in your own experience find that you know if you are in a very uh, heightened emotional state. It is quite a possibility that you, you know, eat more or things like, or say for example, you do not want to eat when you are in a heightened emotional state. So, they actually uh, showed activity in amygdala with respond, uh, you know, responding to pictures of food, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, probably responding to the fact that how appealing a particular food is. So, food in, in that sense, it seems is represented in, a, in the brain in an array of neurons distributed throughout the brain, all of which together represent the total knowledge about the food. How does it look? How does it taste? Whether you like this or not? All of those kind of things. So, that was all uh, from me about uh, knowledge and representation in the brain. I am not really going into too much detail about uh, how uh, different neuroscience studies, uh, but I hope I made the point clear that knowledge is uh, stored in a very distributed uh, fashion in the brain and I hope I also made it clear that where are these differences actually stemming from. Thank you.